Nina Mani. Hello, I'm Leanne from the Community Programs Education Team at the South Australian Museum. I'm speaking to you from the Adelaide Plains, traditional land of the Ghana people, who've maintained a continuous connection to this place for tens of thousands of years. I pay my respects to the Ghana people and also the members of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. It's been a very unusual time and a little while since people have been able to visit us here at the South Australian Museum. I've been thinking a lot about our visitors. They're a very diverse bunch. There's something they all have in common though, curiosity. Being curious and wondering is something you can do anywhere, but hopefully when you come to the museum, you can find some answers. People have been spending a lot more time at home lately and in their local environment. They've been noticing and wondering about the things they find there. We're often asked here at the South Australian Museum for help with identification. Our team at the Discovery Centre are often approached by people who've found some rocks. They're wondering if they found a special kind of rock. It's this special kind of rock that I'm going to be talking about in this STEM Your Boredom segment. I have one here. I'm wondering if you can guess what it is. It's a space rock, a meteorite. This one's from the collection here at the museum. But what if you found one? How would you know? I'm going to be showing you some simple tests that you can do at home. But first, here's Ben with some information and some of the amazing meteorites in the collection here at the South Australian Museum. Hi, my name's Ben and I work here at the South Australian Museum and I look after the state collections for earth sciences. So that means rocks, minerals and meteorites. And meteorites are so important to science that in fact the first thing that you see when you walk into the museum is this meteorite. Now this is a very, very big meteorite known as the Mundrabilla meteorite and it was found over on the Nullarbor Plain in the 1960s and it actually has a total weight of about almost 20 tonnes. Now meteorites are rare things and they don't fall all that often, but you might be surprised to know that in fact a large amount of meteoritic and cosmic dust rains down on our planet every day. We think that there's about 500 tonnes worth of meteoritic and cosmic dust raining down over the planet. We estimate there's about one tonne of cosmic dust raining down on South Australia. As I said before, meteorites are quite rare things. We estimate that there's probably about 500 meteorites of a reasonable size falling on the planet every year. But remember, South Australia is really big. So actually finding any of those meteorites is a tough job. And to date, we've probably found about 70 odd meteorites from South Australia. Now that doesn't seem like much, but South Australia is a very, very good place to find meteorites, particularly over on the Nullarbor Plain. Let's go over to where I work and I'll show you some wonderful South Australian meteorites that we have in the collection. You might not know it, but actually most of the museum's collections aren't on display in the building that you see in North Terrace. We're actually out the back in the Science Centre where the museum's collections are held. Now the study of meteorites is not only important for looking at the fabric of our solar system and the geological history of our planet, but they're also very important in the fields of physics and aerodynamics. We have about 70 meteorites from South Australia here in the collection, but here's a really interesting one that I want to talk to you about. This is the Kitakita Ulu meteorite. Now that's something you might not know, that meteorites are actually named after where they're found. This was found in the 1970s at Lake Kita Kita Ulu in the far north of our state in the Tarare Desert. If you actually look at this one, you'll see that it has an interesting shape. And this actually looks a bit like the nose cone of something like the space shuttle. And you can actually see the direction in which this was flying as it came down to Earth. Not everything we have in the meteorite collections are actually meteorites. We also have the world's largest collection of things called tektites. Now tektites are interesting because they are actually the result of meteorite impacts on our planet, where the force of the meteorite impact was so strong that it actually melted the rocks on the surface and these were blasted up into the atmosphere and returned back down to Earth as these glassy blobs. They take on the most interesting shapes depending on whether the blobs were spinning in a certain direction. But of the most important ones that we have in the collection are these little buttons. Now these little buttons were used in the 1950s to help the NASA space program 
develop re-entry vehicles that could come back through our atmosphere. Another interesting thing about tektites is that in Aboriginal knowledge systems, they are also considered to be objects that fell from the sky. Now, no one could have witnessed the impact that produced these tektites as it happened long before humans are known to have lived in Australia. So Aboriginal people may have noticed things about their shape and composition that led them to this belief. Almost all meteorites come from the asteroid belt, which lies between Jupiter and Mars. There are three types of meteorites that come from there. This one here is what is called an iron meteorite. This is composed solely of nickel and iron metal. The second type of meteorite that we know of are called stony irons, and these ones are made up of equal amounts, iron and nickel, but also stony crystals, as you can see in the surface of this one. The third type of meteorite are called the stones. Large meteorite impacts have been shaping the surface of our planet for millions of years. The most famous and largest in Australia is the Wolf Creek Crater in Western Australia. The Wolf Creek Crater is known by the local Jaru people as Candimalel, which is said to have formed when a star fell out of the sky. This crater predates known human habitation, but it is likely people observed the night sky, including shooting stars, or may have witnessed other meteorite impacts and made a connection with the near-perfect crater on their country. It was not recognised by Europeans until 1947, long after oral history accounts began to be told of the falling star impacting Earth. I have some specimens from the museum's collection here. Some of them are meteorites and some are not. How are we going to tell which is which? As you can see, apart from my original specimen here, which is a little larger, they're all roughly the same size. They all also have that similar dark singed appearance. The first thing you can do is do some visual inspection. So one characteristic of meteorites is that they often have quite a smooth and even surface. The exception to that is if they've been around for a long time, they may have weathered. That's what's happened to this one here. The other thing is that meteorites do not contain air bubbles. So if you can see air bubbles in your specimen, then chances are it's not a meteorite. I have my different specimens here. First thing I notice too when I pick up the different specimens is that there's different weight. So another really important factor about meteorites is that they're very dense. They can be one and a half to three and a half times denser, depending on what they're made from, than a standard earth rock. So if your rock that you found feels very heavy, chances are it could be a meteorite. So if you've done a visual inspection and you think your specimen looks like a meteorite and you've had a bit of a feel and you think that it's quite dense and quite heavy, there's a chance that it could be a meteorite. There's one more test that you can do though that's quite simple and that will give you some more information. You can test for magnetism. I have here a little horseshoe magnet on a string but you could use a fridge magnet so long as it's a fairly strong one. And because meteorites are usually very dense and rich in iron, they will often be um, able to be attracted towards a magnet. So let's try our specimen first, the one we know is a meteorite. And as you can see, it is attracted towards the magnet. So we can go ahead and test our specimens. Definitely attraction there. No, nope. and this specimen's quite light as well. This is another light specimen. No attraction. This is very light and also has quite a lot of air bubbles in it. No attraction there. Definitely quite a strong attraction to the magnet that, for that one. And this one, this one looks quite like I'd imagine it could be a meteorite and it's also a very heavy specimen, so no magnetism. So this one is not being attracted to the magnet. Our final one is our little round dark specimen here, which is also very light and definitely not attracting, being attracted to the magnet. So if I had to make a prediction, I would say that this specimen and this specimen were both meteorites 
the rest are rocks that would normally be found on Earth. And in fact, this one is a sample of slag. It's the waste material left over when metals are refined from ore. This one is an olivine bomb. It was ejected from a volcano. This is another piece of olivine bomb, also ejected from a volcano. And this final one, even though it looks quite a lot like a meteorite, it's not, it's a piece of hematite. So if you wanted to do an investigation using meteorites, that could be a little bit tricky because meteorites, as we know, are quite rare. You could go out into your local environment and try and find some meteorites. And if you were very lucky, you may just do that. Um, if you did happen to find a meteorite, they need to come and be a part of the South Australian Museum's collection. All meteorites found in the state should come and be in this collection. But I'm going to go through a bit of an investigation with you next that you can do without finding a meteorite. And that's investigating another part of a meteorite fall, which is the crater. I'm all set up for my investigation. I've got my equipment. I've got my sand tray. You could use a sand pit if you have one at home or school or in the playground or other surface if you have got that around. I also have my meteorites. Now these are a selection of balls and marbles of different weights and sizes. The final thing I have are some things to do some measuring with. So I have a ruler. Everybody should have one of those at home. I also have these, these are calipers. You can get these at Bunnings or JCAR, or you may even have some at home in your toolbox. They are a way that we can do more precise measuring from point to point. These are electronic ones. There are also manual ones. The final thing I have is a meter long ruler. This is to help me gauge the height of my drop and make sure that I'm dropping my meteorites from the same height each time. So the investigation we're doing today is answering the question, what happens to the crater when we change the meteorite? I'm going to make sure that I do fair testing when I do my investigation, which means that of all the things I'm doing, I will only be changing one thing and keeping everything else the same. That's called my variable. The other thing that you do when you're doing fair testing is to make sure that you do some repeats and you take the measurements and you see whether or not there's a pattern. So I'm going to show you how to do the investigation. We're not actually going to do it because I'll leave that for you to do at home, but I'll give you a good idea of how to, how to go about it. So we're going to take our meter ruler and make sure, first I might just smooth over my surface. You can use a squeegee if you have one, or you can use your hand or a stick. So I'm going to make sure that I keep to my fair testing and only change one variable, which in this case is my meteorite. I'm going to drop from one metre high, but you can choose any height you like, so long as you keep it the same. I'm just going to show you how to drop a few meteorites. By using my ruler and my calipers, we'll be able to do some measuring, maybe measure the width or the depth of the crater. We always try to measure something when we are doing an investigation. So using our calipers, we would measure the width and could also measure the depth. And that's how we do our meteorite investigation. I'm wondering if you can think of other questions that you could ask and answer. Today, we've looked at what happens to the crater when we change the meteorite, but you might like to think about different surfaces, different heights for the drop, maybe different shapes of meteorite. Those are some of the ideas. See what you can come up with. Thank you for joining me for STEM Your Boredom. Bye for now.